So you want to start an animal sanctuary. In this video, we're going to give you four key tips we've learned from helping run our local animal sanctuary as well as drawing from past sanctuary experience. Be sure to stay tuned till the end for our secret bonus sanctuary tip. Just arrived at peak. Frida, how you doing, mate? It's been a while. How you been? Hanging out with your cow friends? All right, Taffy, we're off to Indy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another video. We are just on our way up to Indianapolis because a very special girl is gonna see the doctor. How you doing, Taffy? Over the past seven years, I've supported about 12 different animal sanctuaries. And most recently, Nish and I here have supported our local sanctuary as we've been going through a bit of a transition from a, a co-founder led to a team led. Um, so that's kept us nice and busy, hasn't it, mate? Absolutely, what's it been since about the last seven months? Yeah, yeah, so I think there's so many things to consider when starting a sanctuary, but I don't know about you, but it, it feels like almost every vegan I speak to has at least some dreams of starting a sanctuary. Maybe not everyone, but it's, it seems to be a high, high majority. So, and I know there's, we're still very much learning ourselves, but I think there are things we've learned um, through the past that we think we can help you too. Hey, What's Jen. that, Taffy? Oh yeah, Taffy just wanted me to remind you to make sure to follow our new um, social media, Respect Animal Sanctuary, which will be following our journey across the USA as we find our new home, where we hope to start our new micro sanctuary. So the first of our four tips um, that we've learned from our experience with sanctuaries um, is size matters. The acres, um, all kinds of different things, but especially the number of individuals. And this, this video is not meant to critique one versus the other, it's just our personal observations. And um, a key part of this is, you know, the more individuals you have, the more the um, animal care you need, and, and also fundraising and all these things scale with the size of the sanctuary, obviously. But I, I think the hardest thing about this is learning to say no. And obviously we all wanna rescue as many individuals as we can, and but the, the reality is when you start a sanctuary, you're, get, you're gonna get phone calls, and if you say yes to everyone, you're gonna grow very big very quickly. And if that's your goal for the sanctuary, then you know that's perfectly fine, but just being mindful of what comes with that. And in a way, saying no to new individuals is saying yes to the individuals you already have. Do you wanna add anything to the, the size component? No, I think that there is an element of um, efficiency. So for example, you know, is having two chickens uh, any different to having three chickens? And I think sometimes there isn't a huge difference, but I think when you're getting into larger numbers, it really does make a huge difference. The amount of daily care that's needed, even just things like how many um, individuals on those really, really hot days, making mm. sure they've got enough water and staying cool. So yeah, definitely agree. Yeah, and setting up for different species because while I think as animal advocates and anti-speciesists, you know, it's, it's easy to say, you know, all, the, all of them are the same, but the reality is when it comes to animal care, there are species specific needs. For instance, it's a very different um, thing to be trimming a, a chicken individual's foot compared to trimming a cow's foot. And, and all, you know, the, the, as their nails grow. As well as the knowledge that you need. The knowledge around, you know, you really gotta have um, good knowledge around the different species. What, what individuals aren't able to eat um, certain foods or how to notice if somebody's unwell. And I think that knowledge comes with um, the complexity as well. Well, and it's all, I mean, we'll get into this with our later points, I think, but there's only so much time in the day. And as you, you know, if, if, if a sanctuary gets bigger and bigger, you do have less time to observe the individuals, potentially depending on the staffing and everything, and see if someone is kind of walking a bit differently or behaving a bit differently. So that's all, all stuff to be factored into it. Taffy, what are you doing back here? This video putting you to sleep, mate. Do you have anything to add? So getting on to our second point is climate matters. It's very similar to the first point. And um, while we're not talking about climate change in this video, obviously I think we've all had, I know in the US we've had a phenomenally hot summer. In the UK I know they've had some record breaking temperatures and 
both on the, the, hot, the hot side and the cold side, just bearing in mind which species you're going to be caring for and what kind of environment they're going to be in. Because I know um, in southern Indiana it gets very cold in the wind when they're you know single digits Fahrenheit, and very hot in the summer. I mean, you know, nine, you know, 90s hasn't been uncommon um, for a lot of the summer months. So figuring out if you had the luxury of being able to choose where you set up, just thinking about what climate is best for the individuals. And if you're in an open air barn without um, temperature control, knowing that overnight and during the day, th those are the temperatures that those individuals are gonna um, be forced to, to navigate. The extremes in temperature really impact on the daily tasks, don't they? Down to, um, you know, you got snow in the winter time, also risk to um, the individuals, you know, when there's snow and it gets icy, then individuals um, could potentially slip and hurt themselves to having kind of clear paths. Oh, and us, you know, just trying oh, to get absolutely. to do the average um, thing, you know, if there's a patch of ice between you and feeding someone, it's going to take a little bit longer and might have some injuries associated with it. And on those really, really hot days, the amount of time and effort it takes to do the daily tasks, things are slower, um, making sure that the individuals um, are cool enough um, on those hot days, making sure, you know, they might not be able to or want to get up to go and get water, but they need to be hydrated, so making sure you're kind of bringing water to them. And it's exhausting work, isn't it? It is, it is. Doing okay, little buddy. Big day, huh? And then getting on to point number three is just to be as organized as possible. Now, as we were just discussing, you know, the hours in the day go very quickly on a sanctuary, but just taking that little bit of extra effort, especially when there's more than one person involved, which inevitably there probably will be with most sanctuaries, having um, easy access information, whether it's logins for um, different social media accounts or whatnot, um, you know, really just, just putting it as all in one place as you can. I mean, we use Google for a lot of stuff. Um, for nonprofits, you do get um, Google Workplace for free. Obviously, you have to go through an application process to do that. But just finding some way to share information, whether it's about you know health records, for instance. We recently just set up a centralized um, database as far as tracking all the health records in one place. So literally, you just filter by species or someone's name, and you can see their entire history, which is I, I encourage every sanctuary to at least try to do. Yeah, I know it's helped us a lot when you know if someone's got a sore foot, we can look back and say, oh, actually, they injured it last year. So this maybe this is part of the same thing, or you know maybe something new, and you can start doing that kind of differential diagnosis to use a medical term. On that same document, also, um, you set a tracking, or set up to track um, how many eggs each individual's laid. And so, you know, when yeah. you're collecting them, it makes a huge difference to think, actually, is this, um, do we need to take any action? Yeah, and uh, just to be clear, for those who may be wondering, these are not eggs for us. These, um, we do feed the eggs back to the individuals or, um, you know, the chickens themselves or sometimes depending on weight maintenance and all that, maybe other individuals at the sanctuary. I know one of our pig individuals, one of the first um, intakes, Andy, loves eggs from the mm. chickens. So there's a bit of sharing going on there because he's a bit of a fussy eater, shall we say. And in regards to organization from a financial perspective, that is so critical, whether it's yeah. um, tracking kind of receipts um, but also yep. setting up things like auto pay makes such a difference so that you're not spending your valuable time um, actually processing payments or invoices that actually as much as possible you can set things up on auto pay and then obviously track the amounts um, within that. Oh yeah, tracking finances is massive because if you don't know what you're spending and what you're taking in, it's very difficult to forecast for the future and unless you're independently wealthy, which if you are, great. You're, you know, you got one of the big boxes ticked already to start a sanctuary. Um, you really have to track this stuff because I think a lot of people think like, oh, nonprofits, you know, you, you just, you know, operate and don't worry about making your profits. Like, well, you still have to balance the budget or you're not going to be sustainable. And, and thinking about fundraising, and one thing that I've um, sadly learned is that oftentimes with um, sanctuary donations, if the economy does tighten it up, as in the U.S. at least, and probably worldwide, it is starting to do a little bit of that. Um, which is probably a separate discussion, but um, you know, money given to sanctuaries is, is one of the first things people cut as they're looking at how they can manage their own finances. Mm, definitely. Just being able to plan for those dips and having having enough of a buffer. And that 
brings us to our fourth and final point, expect the unexpected. And if I were to use a little bit more direct language, I would say everything is going to be harder than you think it's going to be. And even with that knowledge, I'm still surprised how difficult things are sometimes. So whether it's the day-to-day -day animal care and literally just getting through, you know, the cleaning and the feeding and, and the rest, of the, giving them their meals, um, can take up a whole day. So to do social media on top of that, which also takes more time than you think it might, depending on what your aims are there. Um, to the finances we were just talking about, everything like, just, just assume stuff that, you know, if you're doing a project, assume you're gonna have to go to the hardware store four times instead of getting everything right the first time. Yeah. You know, you might, you know, we were just digging a ditch the other day to, to put a new drainage system around the farm because it was flooding, which is now sorted thanks to one of our super volunteers and, and several others who came to help with a new French drain. But, you know, we're nearing the end of the project um, filling in the gravel and the, the tractor broke for you know I don't know how many times that's happened. And because it's so old that actually um, particular um, what was it uh, tubing wasn't available so now we've got to order it so we've got the tractor for how many weeks? Yeah so we're hoping this, this tractor I think is from about 1960 so we're hoping we can like sell it for like millions of dollars to museum or something <laughs> but that's probably wishful thinking. I think so. But and also like um, this is kind of a, a add-on point is to, to um, make relationships with in your community as much as you can because we have a phenomenal neighbor, John, who's come over and helped so many times. So that's actually a very experience, you know. He, he said, oh, I'll, I'll bring my tractor over and help you, um, you know, finish up what you need to do tonight. Yeah, tonight. helping fix things and really, yeah, having that community around you makes such a difference. And, it, and it, it's, it's helping them too. So, you know, if we can help as well, you know, we do that. And um, yeah, just, and, and that's part of, you, you don't want to be enemies with your community, which I appreciate. For a lot of sanctuaries, you're surrounded by other properties who care for animals, but it's not a sanctuary. So, um, it's, 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 it's tricky. We just picked up food from a 10th Street Diner, and it's very exciting. As you can see, I've already sampled a bite. Nisha, would you like to try some? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Soft bun. Fish burger. Just going back through Indy. On our way to recollect Taffy from her doctor's visit. Hey Taffy, you ready to go home? <laughs> All right, let's get you home. Get you back to Pico. Oh, yeah. Ready to go home, mate? So if you're still with us, you've made it to our bonus point, which is probably the most important point too, which if you're interested in starting your own sanctuary, the biggest thing you can do is volunteer at a sanctuary before starting your own, preferably extensively covering all aspects of the sanctuary from the animal care to social media to the business side and admin side of things, paying the bills, get involved as much as you can because that will help you to anticipate some of the things I know have been um, you know, surprises or new things for us. Yeah, I think immersing yourself um, in a sanctuary is so, so important. And as well as recognizing where your own strengths are naturally mm -hmm. and where there are some areas at which maybe you're not so strong, whether that's the, the finances or social media and making sure that you surround yourself or create a team that actually fills in some of those gaps. Great point. That, I mean, that's, that's maybe a bonus bonus point is, um, <laughs> you know, finding a team of individuals to, you know, there's a lot of people out there with a common goal, you know, whether it's your priorities, taking in as many individuals as you, as you can, or, you know, maybe doing something smaller where you're really highlighting the individuals on social media and, and more from an awareness building perspective. Um, and obviously, sanctuaries have both those aims in mind, I think, in general, but depending on which one you choose to focus on, it's going to depend on the type of pe uh, team you want to build. Maybe it's more of a social media team for the, the latter, smaller example. So. But you have to, to have a successful sanctuary, you have to cover off all of those key elements. Um, yep. Having passion is, is important, but understanding um, finances and balancing budgets and getting all those admin tasks as well as fundraising is absolutely critical. You know, along similar lines, another thing with um, having a team environment is I think having 
but as, as little hierarchy as possible and just work ideally working together because you're all there for a common goal and as part of that is, is, is if somebody else has a strength or a passion to do something you know letting go of some of that control and actually letting them run with it versus I think oftentimes sometimes um, uh, it, in, in any organization it can be really tempting to, to hold on to everything and say oh, I'll just do it myself it'll be easier da 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 but actually like pulling in others and what it makes sense to do so because obviously sometimes things do need to get done yeah and if anyone's got any other tips obviously we've kind of covered um, a few key ones today but you might have a different opinion so yeah let us know share in the comments um, what your um, top tips are and be sure to give us that thumbs up and thank you so much I look forward to making new videos as well as there's a lot of um, content I have to put out there so I apologize for the absence but we've all obviously been busy um, with the sanctuary life and keep up the awesome work with your animal advocacy especially when it comes to your anti-species language See you soon. Bye. All right, so happy, happy with your singing your song. Here we go. Feel free to chime in if you know the words. Say something, I'm giving up on you. Can you hear it? She's singing too. Captured it smells. Oh my gosh, is that her? I thought it was the cows. <laughs> How do you feel about that smell? <laughs> Animal transport has it's several aspects to it, I isn't there? Put the windows down or something. That is that is potent in a small car. <laughs> I think it'd be potent in a big car. <laughs> Ooh, let's get some airflow. Ooh, that's good. For free resources, such as a discussion guide and language document, check out veganinteractions.com. Thanks for watching.